want to begin a reading here at verse 33. Uh, this is Jesus now before Pilate. And Pilate is in the midst of trying to establish what is the charge against Jesus. And then he decides uh, what to do with that, as we'll see in our reading. Let us hear the word of God. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find not one fault or not one guilty issue in this man. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out. He sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, uh, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It is about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Amen. Now we want to think about the theme, Behold your king delivered up or delivering up King Jesus. 
delivering up King Jesus. That is a significant word or phrase. It's a single word, actually, in this um, chapter. It occurs eight times from the beginning of chapter 18 through to chapter 19 and verse 30. And uh, five of the eight of those times that it's used is in the context of the trial before Pilate. So John is saying to us again and again, Behold your king delivered up. Delivered up. And Pilate, of course, recognized that Jesus had no sin, no wrongdoing. Three times in the chapter, uh, we read verse 38, chapter 19, verse 4, and chapter 19, verse 6. I find, and literally it is, not one, no, not one cause of wrongdoing. And the word I is emphasized there as well. I, Pilate, the Roman governor, do not find this man guilty of any wrongdoing. When things are repeated in Scripture, it is for emphasis. And so God is establishing here clearly and unmistakably at this point that Jesus was without sin and without fault. And yet he was still delivered up. How could that come to be? Well, we saw earlier, or we saw in our reading, that uh, Jesus said to uh, Pilate in verse 11 of chapter 19, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. And so we see that, and we'll come to this later, that Jesus was given up in the will of God, the eternal counsel of God. This is not an accident. This is not a mistake. This is not where Jesus has got on the wrong side of uh, the Jews and of Pilate and um, everything's out of control. No, everything that's happening is happening in the purpose of God. And yet, as Scripture reminds us again and again, the authority of God and the sovereignty of God does not undo the responsibility and accountability of man. The two things merge together in a way in which you and I cannot understand, but we confess and we believe because Scripture teaches it. And so we want to look now at the human agencies by which the Son of God, the sinless Christ, was delivered up in the purpose of God. First thing we want to see is delivered up by Judas. Let's remember who Judas is. The professing disciple for money. Delivered up for money. Or finance, we could put it. We've seen already in our earlier studies in John, I think it was John chapter 12, where Judas is the treasurer. Little band of disciples, 12 of them. And Jesus, their leader, and they're, for the past three, three and a half years, they've been going from place to place. The women went with them to care for their practical needs, but also there were people evidently who gave them money so that they could go and buy food. And at times we see Jesus sending his disciples to buy food. For example, John chapter 4. So Judas is the one who looks after this money. It's a responsible task. And uh, one, no doubt, that Jesus believed in some sense uh, as a man, he was qualified to do. We're not told what Judas's work was beforehand, but it may well have been something to do with money. And so we are told in um, 
Mark chapter 14, verse 10, Judas, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order, and here's our word again, to deliver him up. Well, why would he do that? Did he say, I've discovered he's a false prophet? I've observed him, and uh, what he says isn't true. His miracles are put on, they're a show. No, he went to them to deliver, he went to them to deliver him up, and in his mind was the thought of money. Because we read in Matthew that he asked, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? So here's this confessing disciple, Judas. And he's been with Jesus. And he's heard the teaching of Jesus. He's done the works of the other apostles. Here's a man who's prayed. Here's a man who's taught. Here's a man who's done miracles in the name of Jesus. But there is this conflict going on in the man's heart still between Jesus and money. We read in Matthew 26, and they paid him and they waged him 30 pieces of silver. And John, of course, has given us already an insight into Judas's character in chapter 12. Remember when the woman anointed Jesus with the precious oil? What did Judas say? Wonderful. You're worthy of that, Jesus. No, he said, why was this ointment not sold and the proceeds given to the poor? He said this, John tells us, why? Not because he was a prudent man financially. Not because there was a need down the road and we need to save for that day. No, because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Imagine the heart of the little group of disciples under the ministry of Christ the one who had come to save his people past, present at that time and into the future, down to the end of the ages. There was one among them who was a thief and who was taking and helping himself from the money bag that was given to the work of um, the kingdom. You see, Judas thinks or is thought up to this point that he can be both. That he can follow Christ and he can follow money. And the words of Jesus have fallen upon um, thorny ground. The words where Jesus said, no one can serve two masters, Matthew 6. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will serve the one and despise the other. And you see, when push comes to shove, that's what's now happening with Judas. He's showing that instead of loving Christ, he hates Christ. Instead of serving Christ, he despises Christ. He's willing to sell him for a mere 30 pieces of silver. He's forgotten the words of Jesus where your treasure is, there your heart is also. We're told in Scripture that money is necessary for life. And we're told that the love of money is the root of all evil. And the love of money was the root of Judas's betrayal of Christ. We're reminded that money can be like a venomous snake. And you see some people and they think, well, I can charm a snake. And they're very, very foolish if they don't get the venomous sting taken out of the snake. Because a snake is always a snake. 
and a snake will bite, will bite and kill. And that's what the love of money is like. It's a venomous snake that wraps itself around a person's life more and more and more until there is a final bite. And that's what's happening here with Judas. It's the final bite. And so Judas, he, the professing disciple, delivers up Christ for money. Because he is the professing disciple, we need to reflect upon our own lives this morning. Money is not the only sin. It's not the greatest sin. Scripture sets out a whole range of things uh, that are sins against the Christ and against his kingdom. And they are part of us by nature, but by grace. You and I are to put them to death. We're not to allow them to have dominion over us. We can't say, well, I'll work at all of these areas of my life, but this one area of my life, I'm not going to yield to Christ. That may well have been what Judas was doing. Because the other disciples, we don't read of them finding that he was a bad-tempered man, an angry man. We don't read of him um, using language in a way that was abusive and wrong. We don't read of any other fault in this man. So it seems that he was taking on a huge part of what Jesus was saying. And yet here's a sin that was not put to death and ultimately put him to death. Put him to death. Because after he had betrayed Christ, what did he do? He felt remorse. It wasn't repentance, it was remorse. He went and threw the money back into the temple and he went out and he hung himself. You see, money, his love of money, ultimately took his life and kept him out of the kingdom of God. And so as we come to the table today, as those who confess Christ, let's make sure we have no secret sin, no hidden sin that is known to God fully, but is hidden from all the people around us that are sitting among us here. They don't know. And they think, or, or we think, well, it doesn't matter. I can get away with it. And the reality is we can't get away with it. Because as someone once said, either be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Judas betrayed Christ. He delivered him up because of his love of money. His love of money. But then let's notice secondly this morning, and we're thinking now about the Jews. And they delivered Jesus up. And of course, they are the, the religious people. They're the church-going people. They're the respectable people in society, right down to the church leaders themselves. And these Jews, they delivered Jesus up out of malice. Out of malice. Malice is, well, what is it? It's jealousy. It's envy. It's a feeling of ill towards another. It's where we um, don't like um, another because of the position they hold, because of the popularity they have, because of the gifts they display. And we're peeved that we're not them instead of being content with whom God has made us to be. And you think about the Jews and isn't that what characterizes the Jews, especially the Jewish leadership? Um, from the moment Jesus begins to preach publicly and to do miracles, they're concerned the people are leaving them and going after Jesus. They're concerned he preaches with authority and the people are listening to him gladly. Uh, they're concerned uh, that um, 
Uh, he is the one that the people are lifting up and they're, they're beginning to lift their eyes off them on the street corners and the synagogues when they pray and when they tithe and when they fast. And when the, um, the, the annual feasts come, everybody's wondering, when's Jesus coming? Is Jesus coming? They're not saying, well, what are our leaders going to teach us this time? No, their eyes are on Jesus. And the Jews, um, they, uh, this malice now has filled up. And you see, it is another one of those sins that has not been dealt with. Um, because, of course, there they don't even profess Christ. But they bring Jesus before Pilate. They have condemned him in their own court. They have passed an unsafe and unsatisfactory judgment by the synod of the Jewish church. They led him to the, Romans, the Roman governor's palace. And here's what Matthew says in chapter 27, verse 18. For Pilate knew that because of envy, they delivered him up. Mark says the same thing. Delivered him up. Because of envy. But you see, envy is the very opposite of what Christians are commanded to have. It's the very opposite of what Christ has towards us. Love. And Christ loved us. God loved us in eternity. Christ loved us when he came to this world uh, to die for us and to live for us and to rise for us. And in Christ we are to love one another. There's to be no malice. And yet um, we are warned in Scripture uh, that we need to deal with this sin too. Uh, Paul writes in Titus 3 verse 3, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving breasts, lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. The unbelieving Jews hate Jesus for his sinless character, for his authoritative teaching, for his mighty signs, for his divine works, for his audacious claims, for his penetrating insight into their hearts and minds. They see him as a threat to themselves and their position, their popularity, their pride, their prestige. Behold, your king delivered up by the Jews out of malice. Malice is a word that we don't hear used very often today. But it is a sin of the heart, a response of the heart that is ever present today. It's in workplaces, in offices, and classrooms, and staff rooms, and boardrooms, and factories, and businesses, and shops. It's in politics, uh, and in commerce and business. Malice sometimes is found in, in a very deep way in families as well, between children, um, or even when they're young, and sometimes. If it's not dealt with, it grows and becomes an ugly sin in their adulthood. And so there's malice uh, around us everywhere. And the reality is that as our Savior experienced malice from the unbelieving Jews, the unbelieving religious people, you and I are not greater than the master. The servant is not greater than his master. And so we must not be surprised if when um, we are living a Christian life and we're um, to some measure, not all, be it not perfectly, but we're different, we're distinct because Christ is in us and Christ is beginning to shine through us like a light. And people love darkness instead of the light. And so malice 
We experience malice. Maybe you experience that in your workplace. And when you think about it, you think, what have I done to offend that person? Have I said something wrong? Uh, have I failed to speak to them? Have I excluded them? Have I ignored them? And when you think about it, you say, well, no, I haven't. And the only thing that is that you can come down, that it comes down to, or that you can think of, is it's the, the fact of your faith. They know that you're a person who will not be bought, that you're a person who will stand for truth and righteousness. And so there's a malice towards you that grows up. And so uh, we uh, may well experience that. And we need to, to pray for grace that we don't respond evil for evil, but that we repay evil with good, as Jesus said. Loving our enemies, blessing those who curse us, doing good to those who hate us, and praying for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. Behold your king, delivered up by Judas for the love of money, by the Jews, particularly the Pharisees, the religious leaders, those who are full of their own selves religiously, out of malice. And then we want to see thirdly, behold your king delivered up by Pilate out of card ice. He's a card. He's a card. That's what he is at the end of the day. He knows that Jesus is innocent. He says that. He knows that the Jews don't have power to crucify or to uh, put the Christ to death. And the whole decision lies in his hands. But Pilate weasels uh, around the subject and ultimately abandons Jesus out of Cardus. The trial before Pilate begins early in the morning. And the Jews, of course, make their, con their accusation that he is claiming to be a king. Uh, and uh, so Pilate asks about that. He cross-examines Jesus about that. And Jesus engages with him in that. And Pilate has to say, uh, after having examined Jesus, I find not a single fault in this man, in him. And um, then Pilate delivers his verdict. He acquits Jesus of all wrong. And um, yet he delivers him up to death. Why does he not dismiss the case? Why does he not let the prisoner grow? Sorry, go. Why does he not dissolve the court and send Jesus away? Well, while he would like to release Jesus, ultimately the Jewish populace that he rules is more important to him. It's one against the crowd. And Pilate rules the Jews. He's the secretary of state for Palestine on behalf of the Roman government. And he knows that Passover in particular, it's a fractious time. Look at the Jews the wrong way, say the wrong thing, and you could have an uprising in your hands because there was always an expectation that Messiah would come at Passover. But Messiah is here, and he's before Pilate, and Pilate has the power to release him and to declare that Jesus is innocent, and having declared Jesus that he is innocent of all wrongdoing. But Pilate won't release him. He goes to the crowd, uh, chapter 18, verse 40. He goes to the crowd, and he says, well, I am, we have the custom, we have, a, we have this practice. What about, what about going down this road? I usually release a prisoner at this time of the year, and it seems to me that there's nobody more worthy of that than Jesus. And does he do it? 
No, they shout for Barabbas. Barabbas, who was a robber. And you see, there's the contrast between the innocent Jesus and the guilty Barabbas. And yet these disciples or this crowd will chant and cry for Barabbas. And then Pilate has Christ beaten. And basically, he brings a bruised and bloodied Christ out before them. And he's hoping that this will cause them to have some pity on the Christ. And that maybe that will have softened them up, that they'll be willing to release him. Uh, and again, uh, the Jews respond, away with him, away with him. And so, finally, he comes out and uh, the third time, and we, he says then, behold your king. And the crowd and the Jewish leaders have stirred it up. Um, I think it's Calvin uh, refers to the Jewish leaders, they're like bellows, bellows to a fire. They've been pumping this whole thing up from the moment they brought Jesus before Pilate at nine o'clock in the morning. And so the crowd is now at pitch. Uh, they, there's a fervency and there's a pitch of, of uh, emotion. And they say, they cried out, verse 15, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, imagine these words, we have no king. The people that have been taught that God is their king throughout all the Old Testament, who've seen that and known that, we have no king, that's bad enough. But here's worse still, we have no king but Caesar, the pagan, unbelieving, ungodly Roman governor. And so Pilate, against the chanting crowd, just melts away. He's not a man of principle. He's not a man of courage. He's a man of cardice. This ruler. And so again, we need to think of this with regard to our own lives. There may be times when we are the one that is on trial. <coughs> Perhaps in a place of work. You're accused of doing something wrong. Or people in your family speak evil against you and there's no reasonable explanation for it except the fact that you're a Christian. Or boys and girls in school, you may find those who gang up against you and they do wrong and then they blame it on you. And so the servant again, is not greater than the master. You will find yourself in situations where the crowd may be against you and those who are in power, they have the ability and they have the authority to defend you and they may even know that you're innocent, but they're willing to feed you to the crowd, like feeding meat to the lands. And so to keep the staff happy, they discipline you or they speak to you or they take away some responsibility from you or you're the one that is made to carry, as we say, the can. Yes, we will face cards in this world who know right from wrong but who will run with the crowd instead of standing with you for what is right and what is true. The Apostle Paul experienced this many, many times in his ministry. And sometimes uh, some of the governors did stand and did defend him, but ultimately the Jews were able to do exactly the same thing with Paul. You read the closing chapters of Acts. They got him arrested in Jerusalem. And then they got him brought up to Rome. And he languished in prison. 
And then um, after a second imprisonment, they finally, as the saying is, got their man. But you see, we don't need to be discouraged or disheartened when those things happen. Because we go back to where we began. They would have no authority over you at all. Unless it had been given to them from above. And so you and I, we can go into life and we can say, here I stand, as Luther said, on issues of principle. I can do no other. And we leave it with God as our defender, that he can rescue us. And if he chooses not, as Daniel's friend said, let it be known, we will not bow down to a false God. And so as Jesus was delivered up by Judas, the false disciple, delivered up um, by the Jews out of malice, delivered up by Pilate out of paradise. We time this morning, we could go through church history. We could see that happening again and again and again. But nothing, nothing happens outside of the will and purpose of God our Father. And in nothing that happens will you be forsaken by Christ your Savior. Indeed, you will be strengthened by this Holy Spirit to bear witness and testimony to Christ, to the glory of God in those situations, as Christ himself did. He was delivered up. But look at him. A man totally under control. A man full of respect. A man who's not vengeful. And um, there's no retaliation. And the very things he says uh, are things today that encourage you and me. Because God gave them to him in that moment, in that time or that period. Of his trial. And so, as we come to the table today, on the one hand, we examine ourselves, and that's right, and we look at our lives, and then we reflect on the things that are happening to us in our lives, and we remember that God has all authority, and He's given all authority to Christ over your life and my life forever. And ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Okay, I want to say a few words then before we come uh, to the table. And we're beholding our King now um, on the cross. We're beholding our King um, crucified. Uh, so, um, beholding the crucified. King uh, Jesus was um, crucified. Um, why? Well, we're told uh, by Paul in Romans chapter 4, another reason, verse 25, he was delivered up for our trespasses. So here's the purpose of God in giving um, Pilate and Judas. Uh, and the Jewish leaders, the ability to deliver up Christ to the cross and send him to that cruel cross, that tree of shame, according to the Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. Any one to hang upon a tree was an act of shame. And so Christ is hanging on the tree. Why? Paul, using the same word, delivered up for our trespasses and doesn't just mean narrowly us breaking through the commandments uh, these words are interchangeable trespasses iniquity and sin those are the three words in scripture um, so you can then remember it by either it's or sit iniquity trespass and sin or sin iniquity and trespasses and we have a responsibility before God 
each day to think of our lives in that way and to confess our sin. What today has been my breaking through of the commandments of the Lord? What today has been a falling short of the mark of the Lord? That's sin. Um, we've aimed for it, but we've fallen short. And what today has been iniquity? That twistedness that we were seeing there with Judas that had never been dealt with. What's the iniquity that remains in my heart that I need to, by the grace of God, deal with and confess? So he was delivered up for all of that. And it is by his delivering up that we are forgiven. We have been forgiven our past sins. And we are forgiven our present sins. And it is by his having been delivered up that we will be forgiven our future sins. And so we, we look then here at verses 25 to 27 against that backdrop. Uh, what is to be our response to that? Well, look at the woman and look at John. Verse 25, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So there's, what are these folk doing at the cross? Well, imagine this hostile situation where all manner of slander still being heaped upon Christ and the disciples uh, are further away by and large, the other 10 disciples. But here is a little group of women and here is John and they are close enough to the cross that Jesus can speak from the cross and they can hear over the rabble. They can hear. And so does it not tell us something about these women? How courageous was their confession of Christ? We saw Cardice in Pilate. Here we see a courageous, bold confession because um, we had... Uh, there is no guarantee at this point that um, the Jews won't turn upon Jesus' followers and round them up, as indeed happens in the early chapters of Acts when Peter and John and others are arrested because they're preaching Jesus. They want, will want not only to destroy the leader, the shepherd, but also the sheep. And so here we have these women making this bold confession. They're very standing there. They're not saying anything. Um, and um, John speaks, or John acts when Jesus speaks, but they are there confessing Christ. They're there. In support of Christ. And how important that is. As we come to the table today. That's the basis upon which we come. It's not that my life is sinless. Or yours. It's not that we haven't fallen. Uh, and committed sin. Since we were last here. We all have. But the basis upon which we come to this table today. Is that we confess Christ. And let us do so courageously, courageously. When the crowd is saying something different, let us stand solidly and confess Christ. Sometimes the circumstances, and it's not by saying anything, it's just by doing that you show you belong to Christ. I can think of times when um, in the midst of challenging circumstances um, people have uh, gathered around and you can see here are men here are women who say that is wrong this is right they don't speak a word but by their very actions where they gather where they stand is significant 
And so confessing Christ, yes, with our words, but also confessing Christ with our actions, where we stand, who we stand with, that we stand for Jesus uh, in our lives. And so Jesus delights in that. Uh, he's concerned for his mother here. He loves her and he entrusts her to the disciple um, <coughs> who loves him and whom he loves, uh, John. So as we come to the table then, let's come as a people who are confessing Jesus the King. Not just today, but tomorrow, next week, in our words and in and by our actions. I want to think now for a moment or two about um, serving uh, the King. Serving the King. And we uh, are looking at the verses 38 to 42 of John 19. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. <coughs> Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices as in the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been led. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the, the tomb was close at hand, they led Jesus there. We see here, again, boldness and courage in the part of these two men serving Jesus the King. Uh, Joseph um, provides the tomb. Nicodemus provides the spices. That's what um, they had. That's I don't know whether it would be an arrangement made or we're not told that, but that's what each of them brings. And so we think of them bringing according to their ability, serving out of the resources they have. The tomb was Joseph's own tomb. No one had been led in it. And so Christ was buried in a borrowed tomb. But also we want to note how uh, these men uh, from their backgrounds were told that Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. And we've seen that theme of the fear of the Jews coming out several times when the man who was born blind was healed. His parents were afraid of the Jews because they were putting people, excommunicating people from the church because they believed in Jesus. Uh, some things never change. But here uh, we see this man now, Joseph, standing clearly. This was a defining moment and a decisive moment for Joseph. And there are defining and decisive moments in our lives. We thank God for them. And um, uh, perhaps today is a defining moment for someone here. Maybe for you boys who haven't yet um, confessed Christ, it's a defining moment because you're saying today, I want to serve this Jesus who died for me on the cross. Or some of us as adults, maybe we haven't been as clear in our confession. Maybe we've gone with the crowd or we've not been quite in the crowd, but we've hung at the back of the crowd. And we're more with the crowd than we are um, with the Christ. And so perhaps that is the decisive moment for us today. But here's this man. He now comes out clearly um, uh, for Jesus. And then, of course, Nicodemus, he is one of the Sanhedrin. So he's going against the judgment of his fellow elders. And um, humanly speaking, uh, at ground level, what a dangerous thing that was to do. But here's a man who is going to serve Jesus. It's going to cost him, um, and, uh, but he's going to do it. 
And so each serves regardless of the cost, according to ability and opportunity. So let us leave this table resolved to serve Christ uh, at cost to ourselves and according to the opportunity and ability that he gives us. And that may uh, mean that we've got to make changes in what we do the rest of our Lord's Day so that we're at evening worship. Have to get our priorities right. Um, our Wednesday evening meeting when we meet for prayer and for fellowship, so important. And again, perhaps that's the, the cost uh, for you. Uh, we need to um, keep on supporting the Lord's work here as we have ability and opportunity, not saying, well, actually, that doesn't suit me, or another time, because then we're ignoring the cost, the cost of serving Christ.